And Then There Were None, by Agatha Christie, read by Hugh Fraser. In the corner of a first-class smoking carriage, Mr. Justice Wargrave, lately retired from the bench, puffed at a cigar and ran an interested eye through the political news in the Times. He laid the paper down and glanced out of the window. They were running now through Somerset. He glanced at his watch. Another two hours to go. He went over in his mind all that had appeared in the papers about Indian Island. There had been its original purchase by an American millionaire who was crazy about yachting, and an account of the luxurious modern house he had built on this little island off the Devon coast. The unfortunate fact that the new third wife of the American millionaire was a bad sailor had led to the subsequent putting up of the house and island for sale. Various glowing advertisements of it had appeared in the papers. Then came the first bald statement that it had been bought by a Mr. Owen. After that, the rumours of the gossip writers had started. Indian Island had really been bought by Miss Gabrielle Turl, the Hollywood film star. She wanted to spend some months there free from all publicity. Busy B had hinted delicately that it was to be an abode for royalty. Mr. Merriweather had had it whispered to him that it had been bought for a honeymoon. Young Lord L. had surrendered to Cupid at last. Jonas knew for a fact that it had been purchased by the Admiralty with a view to carrying out some very hush-hush experiments. Definitely, Indian Island was news. From his pocket, Mr. Justice Wargrave drew out a letter. The handwriting was practically illegible, but words here and there stood out with unexpected clarity. Dearest Lawrence, such years since I heard anything of you, must come to Indian Island, the most enchanting place, so much to talk over, old days, communion with nature, bask in sunshine, twelve forty from Paddington, meet you at Oakbridge. And his correspondent signed herself with a flourish, his ever, Constance Culmington. Mr. Justice Wargrave cast back in his mind to remember when exactly he had last seen Lady Constance Calmington. It must be seven, no, eight years ago. She had then been going to Italy to bask in the sun and be at one with nature and the contadini. Later he had heard she had proceeded to Syria, where she proposed to bask in yet stronger sun and live at one with nature and the Bedouin. Constance Cummington, he reflected to himself, was exactly the sort of woman who would buy an island and surround herself with mystery. Nodding his head in gentle approval of his logic, Mr. Justice Wargrave allowed his head to nod. He slept. Vera Claythorne, in a third-class carriage with five other travellers in it, leaned her head back and shut her eyes. How hot it was travelling by train today! It would be nice to get to the sea. Really, a great piece of luck getting this job. When you wanted a holiday post, it nearly always meant looking after a swarm of children. Secretarial holiday posts were much more difficult to get. Even the agency hadn't held out much hope. And then the letter had come. I have received your name from the skilled women's agency, together with their recommendation. I understand they know you personally. I shall be glad to pay you the salary you ask, and shall expect you to take up your duties on August the 8th. The train is the 12.40 from Paddington, and you will be met at Oakbridge Station. I enclose five-pound notes for expenses. Yours truly, Una Nancy Owen. And at the top was the stamped address Indian Island, Sticklehaven, Devon. Indian Island? Why, there had been nothing else in the papers lately all sorts of hints and interesting rumours, though probably that was mostly untrue. But the house had certainly been built by a millionaire, and was said to be absolutely the last word in luxury. Vera Claythorne, tired by a recent strenuous term at school, thought to herself, Being a games mistress in a third-class school isn't much of a catch. If only I could get a job at some decent school. And then, with a cold feeling round her heart, she thought, But I'm lucky to have even this. After all, people don't like a coroner's inquest, even if the coroner did acquit me of all blame. He had even complimented her on her presence of mind and courage, she remembered. For an inquest it couldn't have gone better. And Mrs. Hamilton had been kindness itself to her. Only Hugo. 
but she wouldn't think of Hugo. Suddenly, in spite of the heat in the carriage, she shivered and wished she wasn't going to the sea. A picture rose clearly before her mind. Cyril's head, bobbing up and down, swimming to the rock, up and down, up and down, at herself swimming in easy, practiced strokes after him, cleaving her way through the water, but knowing only too surely that she wouldn't be in time. The sea, its deep, warm blue, mornings spent lying out on the sands. Hugo. Hugo, who had said he loved her. She must not think of Hugo. She opened her eyes and frowned across at the man opposite her. A tall man with a brown face, light eyes set rather close together, and an arrogant, almost cruel mouth. She thought to herself, I bet he's been to some interesting parts of the world and seen some interesting things. Philip Lombard, summing up the girl opposite in a mere flash of his quick-moving eyes, thought to himself, quite attractive, a bit schoolmistressy, perhaps. A cool customer, he should imagine, and one who could hold her own in love or war. He'd rather like to take her on. He frowned. No, cut out all that kind of stuff. This was business. He'd got to keep his mind on the job. What exactly was up, he wondered. The solicitor had been damned mysterious. Take it or leave it, Captain Lombard. He had said thoughtfully, A hundred guineas, eh? He had said it in a casual way, as though a hundred guineas was nothing to him. A hundred guineas, when he was literally down to his last square meal. He had fancied, though, that the solicitor had not been deceived. He had said in the same casual tone, And you can't give me any further information? Mr. Isaac Morris had shaken his little bald head very positively. No, Captain Lombard, the matter rests there. It is understood by my client that your reputation is that of a good man in a tight place. I am empowered to hand you one hundred guineas, in return for which you will travel to Sticklehaven, Devon. The nearest station is Oakbridge. You will be met there and motored to Sticklehaven, where a motor launch will convey you to Indian Island. There you will hold yourself at the disposal of my client. Lombard had said abruptly, For how long? Not longer than a week at most. Fingering his small moustache, Captain Lombard said, For well, you understand I can't undertake anything illegal. He had darted a very sharp glance at the other as he had spoken. There had been a very faint smile on the lips of Mr. Morris as he answered gravely, if anything illegal is proposed, you will, of course, be at perfect liberty to withdraw. Damn the smooth little brute, he had smiled. It was as though he knew very well that in Lombard's past actions, legality had not always been a sine qua non. Lombard's own lips parted in a grin. By Jove, he'd sailed pretty near the wind once or twice, but he'd always got away with it. There wasn't much he drew the line at, really. No, there wasn't much he drew the line at. He fancied that he was going to enjoy himself at Indian Island. In a non-smoking carriage, Miss Emily Brent sat very upright, as was her custom. She was sixty-five, and she did not approve of lounging. Her father, a colonel of the old school, had been particular about deportment. The present generation was shamelessly lax, in their carriage, and in every other way. Enveloped in an aura of righteousness and unyielding principles, Miss Brent sat in her crowded third-class carriage and triumphed over its discomfort and its heat. Everyone made such a fuss over things nowadays. They wanted injections before they had teeth pulled, they took drugs if they couldn't sleep, they wanted easy chairs and cushions, and the girls allowed their figures to slop about anyhow and lay about half-naked on the beaches in summer. Miss Brent's lips set closely. She would like to make an example of certain people. She remembered last year's summer holiday. This year, however, it would be quite different. Indian Island. Mentally, she re-read the letter, which she had already read so many times. Dear Miss Brent, I do hope you remember me. We were together at Bellhaven Guesthouse in August some years ago, and we seemed to have so much in common. I am starting a guesthouse of my own on an island off the coast of Devon. 
I think there is really an opening for a place where there is good, plain cooking and a nice, old-fashioned type of person. None of this nudity and gramophones half the night. I shall be very glad if you could see your way to spending your summer holiday on Indian Island. Quite free. As my guest. Would early in August suit you? Perhaps the 8th? Yours sincerely, U.N. <laughs> what was the name? The signature was rather difficult to read. Emily Brent thought impatiently. So many people write their signatures quite illegibly. She let her mind run back over the people at Belhaven. She had been there two summers running. There had been that nice middle-aged woman, Mrs. Mrs. Uh, oh, now what was her name? Her father had been a canon. And then there had been a Miss... Olton? Orman? No, surely it was Oliver. Yes, Oliver. Indian Island. There had been things in the paper about Indian Island. Something about a film star? Or, or was it an American millionaire? Of course, often those places went very cheap. Islands didn't suit everybody. They thought the idea was romantic, but when they came to live there, they realized the disadvantages and were only too glad to sell. Emily Brent thought to herself, I shall be getting a free holiday at any rate. With her income so much reduced and so many dividends not being paid, that was indeed something to take into consideration. If only she could remember a little more about Mrs. Or was it Miss Oliver? General MacArthur looked out of the carriage window. The train was just coming into Exeter, where he had to change. Damnable, these slow branch-line trains. This place, Indian Island, was really no distance at all as the crow flies. He hadn't got it clear who this fellow Owen was. Friend of Spoof Leggards, apparently, and of Johnny Dyer's. One or two of your old cronies are coming. Would like to have a talk over old times, the letter had said. Well, he'd enjoy a chat about old times. He'd had a fancy lately that fellows were rather fighting shy of him. All owing to that damned rumour. By God, it was pretty hard. Nearly thirty years ago now. Armstrong had talked, he supposed. Damned young pup. What did he know about it? Oh, well, no good brooding about these things. One fancied thing sometimes. Fancied a fellow was looking at you queerly. This Indian island now. He'd be interested to see it. A lot of gossip flying about. Looks as though there might be something in the rumour that the Admiralty or the War Office or the Air Force had got hold of it. Young Elmer Robson, the American millionaire, had actually built the place. Spent thousands on it, so it was said. Every mortal luxury. Exeter. And an hour to wait. And he didn't want to wait. He wanted to get on. Dr. Armstrong was driving his Morris across Salisbury Plain. He was very tired. Success had its penalties. There had been a time when he had sat in his consulting room in Harley Street, correctly apparelled, surrounded with the most up-to-date appliances and the most luxurious furnishings, and waited. Waited through the empty days for his venture to succeed or fail. Well, it had succeeded. He'd been lucky. Lucky and skilful, of course. He was a good man at his job. But that wasn't enough for success. You had to have luck as well, and he'd had it. An accurate diagnosis, a couple of grateful women patients, women with money and position, and word had got about. You ought to try Armstrong. Quite a young man, but so clever. Pam had been to all sorts of people for years, and he put his finger on the trouble at once. The ball had started rolling. And now Dr. Armstrong had definitely arrived. His days were full. He had little leisure, and so on this August morning he was glad that he was leaving London and going to be for some days on an island off the Devon coast. Not that it was exactly a holiday. The letter he had received had been rather vague in its terms, but there was nothing vague about the accompanying cheque, a whacking fee. These Owens must be rolling in money. Some little difficulty, it seemed, a husband who was worried about his wife's health and wanted a report on it without her being alarmed. She wouldn't hear of seeing a doctor. Her nerves. Nerves. The doctor's eyebrows went up. These women and their nerves. Well, it was good for business, after all. 
Half the women who consulted him had nothing the matter with them but boredom. But they wouldn't thank you for telling them so, and one could usually find something. A slightly uncommon condition of the... Uh, some long word. Nothing at all serious, but it just needs putting right. A simple treatment. Well, medicine was mostly faith-healing when it came to it, and he had a good manner. He could inspire hope and belief. Lucky that he'd managed to pull himself together in time after that business ten, no, fifteen years ago. It had been a near thing, that. He'd been going to pieces. The shock had pulled him together. He'd cut out drink altogether. By Jove, it had been a near thing, though. With a devastating, ear-splitting blast on the horn, an enormous Supersports Dalmain car rushed past him at eighty miles an hour. Dr. Armstrong nearly went into the hedge. One of these young fools who tore around the country, he hated them. That had been a near shave, too. Damned young fool. Tony Marston, roaring down into Mere, thought to himself, The amount of cars crawling about the roads is frightful. Always someone blocking your way, and they will drive in the middle of the road. Pretty hopeless driving in England anyway. Not like France, where you really could let out. Should he stop here for a drink or push on? Heaps of time. Only another hundred miles and a bit to go. He'd have a gin and ginger beer. Fizzing hot day. This island place ought to be rather good fun if the weather lasted. Who were these Owens, he wondered. Rich and stinking, probably. Badger was rather good at nosing people like that out. Of course, he had to, poor old chap, with no money of his own. Hope they'd do one well in drinks. Never knew of these fellows who'd made their money and weren't born to it. Pity that story about Gabriel Turl having bought Indian Island wasn't true. He'd like to have been in with that film star crowd. Oh, well, he supposed there'd be a few girls there. Coming out of the hotel, he stretched himself, yawned, looked up at the blue sky, and climbed into the Dalmain. Several young women looked at him admiringly. His six feet of well-proportioned body, his crisp hair, tanned face, and intensely blue eyes. He let in the clutch with a roar and leapt up the narrow street. Old men and errand boys jumped for safety. The latter looked after the car admiringly. Anthony Marston proceeded on his triumphal progress. Mr. Bloor was in the slow train from Plymouth. There was only one other person in his carriage, an elderly, seafaring gentleman with a bleary eye. At the present moment he had dropped off to sleep. Mr. Bloor was writing carefully in a little notebook. "'That's the lot,' he muttered to himself. "'Emily Brent, Vera Claythorne, Dr. Armstrong, Anthony Marston, Old Justice Wargrave.' Philip Lombard, General MacArthur, CMG, DSO, manservant and wife, Mr. and Mrs. Rogers. He closed the notebook and put it back in his pocket. He glanced over at the corner, and the slumbering man, at one over the eight, diagnosed Mr. Bloor accurately. He went over things carefully and conscientiously in his mind. Job ought to be easy enough, he ruminated. Don't see how I can slip up on it. Hope I look all right. He stood up and scrutinized himself anxiously in the glass. The face reflected there was of a slightly military cast with a moustache. There was very little expression in it. The eyes were grey and set rather close together. Might be a major, said Mr. Bloor. Oh, I forgot. There's that old military gent. He'd spot me at once. South Africa, said Mr. Bloor. That's my line. None of these people have anything to do with South Africa, and I've just been reading that travel folder so I can talk about it all right. Fortunately, there were all sorts and types of colonials. As a man of means from South Africa, Mr. Bloor felt he could enter into any society unchallenged. Indian Island. He remembered Indian Island as a boy, smelly sort of rock covered with gulls, stood about a mile from the coast. It had got its name from its resemblance to a man's head, an American Indian profile. Funny idea to go and build a house on it, awful in bad weather, but millionaires were full of whims. The old man in the corner woke up and said, You can't never tell at sea. Never, Mr. Bloor said soothingly. 
Uh, that's right, you can't, the old man hiccuped twice and said plaintively, There's a squall coming, Mr. Bloor said. No, no, mate, it's a lovely day, the old man said angrily. There's a squall ahead, I can smell it. Uh, maybe you're right, said Mr. Bloor pacifically. The train stopped at a station, and the old fellow rose unsteadily. This is where I get out. He fumbled with the window. Mr. Bloor helped him. The old man stood in the doorway. He raised a solemn hand and blinked his bleary eyes. Watch and pray, he said. Watch and pray. The deserve judgment is his hand. He collapsed through the doorway onto the platform. From a recumbent position, he looked up at Mr. Bloor and said with immense dignity, I'm talking to you, young man. The Day of Judgment is very close at hand. Subsiding onto his seat, Mr. Bloor thought to himself, He's nearer the Day of Judgment than I am. But there, as it happens, he was wrong. Chapter 2 Outside Oakbridge Station, a little group of people stood in momentary uncertainty. Behind them stood porters with suitcases. One of these called, Jim. The driver of one of the taxis stepped forward. You for Indian Island, maybe? he asked in a soft Devon voice. All voices gave assent, and then immediately afterwards gave quick, surreptitious glances at each other. The driver said, addressing his remarks to Mr. Justice Wargrave as the senior member of the party, There are two taxis here, sir. One of them must wait till the slow train from Exeter gets in. Matter of five minutes. There's one gentleman coming by that. Perhaps one of you wouldn't mind waiting. You'll be more comfortable that way. Vera Claythorne, her own secretarial position clear in her mind, spoke at once. I'll wait, she said, if you will go on. She looked at the other three. Her glance and voice had that slight suggestion of command in it that comes from having occupied a position of authority. She might have been directing which tennis sets the girls were to play in. Miss Brent said stiffly, Thank you, bent her head, and entered one of the taxis, the door of which the driver was holding open. Mr. Justice Wargrave followed her. Captain Lombard said, I'll wait with Miss uh, Claythorne, said Vera. My name is Lombard. Philip Lombard. The porters were piling luggage on the taxi. Inside, Mr. Justice Wargrave said with due legal caution, Beautiful weather we are having. Miss Brent said, Yes, indeed. A very distinguished old gentleman, she thought to herself, quite unlike the usual type of man in seaside guesthouses. Evidently, Mrs. or Miss Oliver had good connections. Mr. Justice Wargrave inquired, do you know this part of the world well? I have been to Cornwall and to Torquay, but this is my first visit to this part of Devon. The judge said, I also am unacquainted with this part of the world. The taxi drove off. The driver of the second taxi said, Like to sit inside while you're waiting? Vera said decisively, Not at all. Captain Lombard smiled. He said, that sunny wall looks more attractive, unless you'd rather go inside the station. Uh, no, indeed, it's so delightful to get out of that stuffy train. He answered, Yes, travelling by train is rather trying in this weather. Vera said conventionally, I do hope it lasts. The weather, I mean. Our English summers are so treacherous. With a slight lack of originality, Lombard asked, Do you know this part of the world well? No, I've never been here before, she added quickly, conscientiously determined to make her position clear at once. I haven't even seen my employer yet. Your employer? Yes, I'm Mrs. Owen's secretary. Oh, I see. Just imperceptibly, his manner changed. It was slightly more assured, easier in tone. He said, Well, isn't that rather unusual? Vera laughed. <laughs> I don't think so. Her own secretary was suddenly taken ill, and she wired to an agency for a substitute, and they sent me. So that was it. And suppose you don't like the post when you've got there? Vera laughed again. Oh, it's only temporary. A holiday post. I've got a permanent job at a girls' school. As a matter of fact, I'm frightfully thrilled at the prospect of seeing Indian Island. 
There's been such a lot about it in the papers. Is it really very fascinating? Lombard said, I don't know. I haven't seen it. Oh, really? The Owens are frightfully keen on it, I suppose. What are they like? Do tell me. Lombard thought, Awkward, this. Am I supposed to have met them or not? He said quickly, There's a wasp crawling up your arm. No, keep quite still. He made a convincing pounce. There. It's gone. Oh, thank you. There are a lot of wasps about this summer. Yes, I suppose it's the heat. Who are we waiting for, do you know? I haven't the least idea. The loud, drawn-out scream of an approaching train was heard. Lombard said, Well, that'll be the train now. It was a tall, soldierly old man who appeared at the exit from the platform. His grey hair was clipped close, and he had a neatly trimmed white moustache. His porter, staggering slightly under the weight of the solid leather suitcase, indicated Vera and Lombard. Vera came forward in a competent manner. She said, I am Mrs. Owen's secretary. There is a car here waiting. She added, This is Mr. Lombard. The faded blue eyes, shrewd in spite of their age, sized up Lombard. For a moment, a judgment showed in them, had there been anyone to read it. Good-looking fellow. Something just a little wrong about him. The three of them got into the waiting taxi. They drove through the sleepy streets of Little Oakbridge and continued about a mile on the main Plymouth Road. Then they plunged into a maze of cross-country lanes, steep, green, and narrow. General MacArthur said, Don't know this part of Devon at all. My little place is in East Devon, just on the borderline of Dorset. Vera said, It really is lovely here, the hills and the red earth, and everything so green and luscious-looking. Philip Lombard said critically, well, It's a bit shut in. I like open country myself, where you can see what's coming. General MacArthur said to him, You've seen a bit of the world, I fancy. Lombard shrugged his shoulders, disparagingly. I've knocked about here and there, sir. He thought to himself, He'll ask me now if I was old enough to be in the war. These old boys always do. But General MacArthur did not mention the war. They came up over a steep hill and down a zigzag track to Sticklehaven, a mere cluster of cottages with a fishing boat or two drawn up on the beach. Illuminated by the setting sun, they had their first glimpse of Indian Island, jutting up out of the sea to the south. Vera said, surprised, It's a long way out. She had pictured it differently, close to shore, crowned with a beautiful white house. But there was no house visible, only the boldly silhouetted rock, with its faint resemblance to a giant Indian's head. There was something sinister about it. She shivered faintly. Outside a little inn, the Seven Stars, three people were sitting. There was the hunched, elderly figure of the judge, the upright form of Miss Brent, and a third man, a big, bluff man, who came forward and introduced himself. "'Thought we might as well wait for you,' he said. "'Make one trip of it. Allow me to introduce myself. Name's Davis, Natal. South Africa's my Natal spot.' <laughs> he laughed breezily. Mr. Justice Wargrave looked at him with active malevolence. He seemed to be wishing that he could order the court to be cleared. Miss Emily Brent was clearly not sure if she liked colonials. "'Anyone care for a little nip before we embark?' asked Mr. Davis hospitably. Nobody assenting to this proposition, Mr. Davis turned and held up a finger. We "'Mustn't delay, then. Our good host and hostess will be expecting us,' he said. He might have noticed that a curious constraint came over the other members of the party. It was as though the mention of their host and hostess had a curiously paralyzing effect upon the guests. In response to Davis's beckoning finger, a man detached himself from a nearby wall against which he was leaning and came up to them. His rolling gait proclaimed him a man of the sea. He had a weather-beaten face and dark eyes with a slightly evasive expression. He spoke in his soft, Devon voice. Will you be ready to be starting for the island, ladies and gentlemen? The boat's waiting. There's two gentlemen coming by car, but Mr. Owen's orders was not to wait for them, as they might arrive at any time. The party got up. Their guide led them along a small stone jetty, a 
Alongside it, a motorboat was lying. Emily Brent said, Oh, that's a very small boat. The boat's owner said persuasively, She's a fine boat, that ma'am. You could go to Plymouth in her, as easy as winking. Mr. Justice Wargrave said sharply, There are a good many of us. She'd take double the number, sir. Philip Lombard said in a pleasant, easy voice, oh, It's quite all right. Glorious weather, no swell. Rather doubtfully, Miss Brent permitted herself to be helped into the boat. The others followed suit. There was as yet no fraternising among the party. It was as though each member of it was puzzled by the other members. They were just about to cast loose when their guide paused, boat-hook in hand. Down the steep track into the village a car was coming, a car so fantastically powerful, so superlatively beautiful, that it had all the nature of an apparition. At the wheel sat a young man, his hair blown back by the wind. In the blaze of the evening light he looked not a man but a young god, a hero god out of some northern saga. He touched the horn, and a great roar of sound echoed from the rocks of the bay. It was a fantastic moment. In it, Antony Marston seemed to be something more than mortal. Afterwards, more than one of those present remembered that moment. Fred Narricott sat by the engine, thinking to himself that this was a queer lot. Not at all his idea of what Mr. Owen's guests were likely to be. He'd expected something altogether more classy. Togged-up women and gentlemen, in yachting costume, and all very rich and important-looking. Not at all like Mr. Elmer Robson's parties. A faint grin came to Fred Narragot's lips as he remembered the millionaire's guests. <laughs> that had been a party, if you like. And the drink they'd got through. This Mr. Owen must be a very different sort of gentleman. Funny it was, thought Fred, that he never yet set eyes on Owen. Or his missus either. Never been down here yet, he hadn't. Everything ordered and paid for by that Mr. Morris. Instructions always very clear and payment prompt, but it was odd all the same. The papers said there was some mystery about Owen. Mr. Narricott agreed with them. Perhaps, after all, it was Miss Gabrielle Turrell who had bought the island. But that theory departed from him as he surveyed his passengers. Oh, not this lot. None of them looked likely to have anything to do with a film star. He summed them up dispassionately. One old maid, the sour kind, he knew them well enough. She was a tartar, he could bet. Old military gentleman, real army by the look of him. Nice-looking young lady. But the ordinary kind, not glamorous. No Hollywood touch about her. That bluff, cheery gent, he wasn't a real gentleman. Retired tradesman, that's what he is, thought Fred Narricott. The other gentleman, the lean, hungry-looking gentleman with the quick eyes, he was a queer one, he was. Just possible he might have something to do with the pictures? No. There was only one satisfactory passenger in the boat, the last gentleman. The one who had arrived in the car. And what a car! A car such as had never been seen at Stickelhaven before. Must have cost hundreds and hundreds a car like that. He was the right kind. Born to money, he was. If the party had all been like him, he'd understand it. Queer business, when you came to think of it. The whole thing was queer. Very queer. The boat churned its way round the rock. Now, at last, the house came into view. The south side of the island was quite different. It shelved gently down to the sea. The house was there facing south, low and square and modern-looking, with round windows letting in all the light. An exciting house, a house that lived up to expectation. Fred Narricott shut off the engine. They nosed their way gently into a little natural inlet between rocks. Philip Lombard said sharply, "'Must be difficult to land here in dirty weather.' Fred Narricott said cheerfully, Can't land on Indian Island when there's a southeasterly. Sometimes tis cut off for a week or more. Vera Claythorne thought, The catering must be very difficult. That's the worst of an island. All the domestic problems are so worrying. The boat grated against the rocks. Fred Narricott jumped out, and he and Lombard helped the others to alight. Narricott made the boat fast to a ring in the rock. Then he led the way up steps cut in the rock. General MacArthur said, Ah, delightful spot! But he felt uneasy. 
damned odd sort of place. As the party ascended the steps and came out on a terrace above, their spirits revived. In the open doorway of the house, a correct butler was awaiting them, and something about his gravity reassured them, and then the house itself was really most attractive, and the view from the terrace magnificent. The butler came forward, bowing slightly. He was a tall, lank man, grey-haired and very respectable. He said, "'Will you come this way, please?' In the wide hall, drinks stood ready, rows of bottles. Anthony Marston's spirits cheered up a little. He'd just been thinking this was a rum kind of show. None of his lot. What could old Badger have been thinking about to let him in for this? However, the drinks were all right. Plenty of ice, too. What was it the butler chap was saying? A Mr. Owen, unfortunately delayed, unable to get here till tomorrow. Instructions, uh, everything they wanted, if they would like to go to their rooms. Dinner would be at eight o'clock. Vera had followed Mrs. Rogers upstairs. The woman had thrown open a door at the end of a passage, and Vera had walked into a delightful bedroom with a big window that opened wide upon the sea and another looking east. She uttered a quick exclamation of pleasure. Mrs. Rogers was saying, I hope you've got everything you want, miss. Vera looked round. Her luggage had been brought up and had been unpacked. At one side of the room a door stood open into a pale blue tiled bathroom. She said quickly, Yes, everything, I think. You'll ring the bell if you want anything, miss. Mrs. Rogers had a flat, monotonous voice. Vera looked at her curiously. What a white, bloodless ghost of a woman, very respectable-looking, with her hair dragged back from her face and her black dress, queer light eyes that shifted the whole time from place to place. Vera thought, she looks frightened of her own shadow. Yes, that was it, frightened. She looked like a woman who walked in mortal fear. A little shiver passed down Vera's back. What on earth was the woman afraid of? She said pleasantly, I'm Mrs. Owen's new secretary. I expect you know that. Mrs. Rogers said, No, miss. I don't know anything. Just a list of the ladies and gentlemen and what rooms they were to have. Vera said, Mrs. Owen didn't mention me. Mrs. Rogers' eyelashes flickered. I haven't seen Mrs. Owen. Not yet. We only came here two days ago. Extraordinary people, these Owens, thought Vera. Aloud, she said, What staff is there here? Just me and Rogers, miss. Vera frowned. Eight people in the house, ten with the host and hostess, and only one married couple to do for them. Mrs. Rogers said, I'm a good cook, and Rogers is handy about the house. I didn't know, of course, that there was to be such a large party. Vera said, But you can manage? Oh, yes, miss, I can manage. If there's to be large parties often, perhaps Mrs. Owen could get extra help in. Vera said, I expect so. Mrs. Rogers turned to go. Her feet moved noiselessly over the ground. She drifted from the room like a shadow. Vera went over to the window and sat down on the window seat. She was faintly disturbed. Everything, somehow, was a little queer. The absence of the Owens the pale, ghost-like Mrs. Rogers, and the guests. Yes, the guests were queer, too. An oddly assorted party. Vera thought, I wish I'd seen the Owens. I wish I knew what they were like. She got up and walked restlessly about the room. A perfect bedroom, decorated throughout in the modern style. Off-white rugs on the gleaming parquet floor, faintly tinted walls, a long mirror surrounded by lights, a mantelpiece bare of ornaments save for an enormous block of white marble shaped like a bear, a piece of modern sculpture, in which was inset a clock. Over it, in a gleaming chromium frame, was a big square of parchment, a poem. She stood in front of the fireplace and read it. It was the old nursery rhyme that she remembered from her childhood days. Ten little Indian boys went out to dine. One choked his little self, and then there were nine. Nine little Indian boys sat up very late. One overslept himself, and then there were eight. 
Eight little Indian boys travelling in Devon. One said he'd stay there, and then there were seven. Seven little Indian boys chopping up sticks. One chopped himself in halves, and then there were six. Six little Indian boys playing with a hive, a bumblebee stung one, and then there were five. Five little Indian boys going in for law, one got in chancery, and then there were four. Four little Indian boys going out to sea, a red herring swallowed one, and then there were three. Three little Indian boys walking in the zoo, a big bear hugged one, and then there were two. Two little Indian boys sitting in the sun, one got frizzled up, and then there was one. One little Indian boy left all alone. He went and hanged himself, and then there were none. Vera smiled. Of course, this was Indian Island. She went and sat again by the window, looking out to sea. How big the sea was! From here there was no land to be seen anywhere, just a vast expanse of blue water. Rippling in the evening sun. The sea. So peaceful today. Sometimes so cruel. The sea that dragged you down to its depths. Drowned. Found drowned. Drowned at sea. Drowned. 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 No! She wouldn't remember. She would not think of it. All that was over. Dr. Armstrong came to Indian Island just as the sun was sinking into the sea. On the way across, he had chatted to the boatman, a local man. He was anxious to find out a little about these people who owned Indian Island, but the man, Narricot, seemed curiously ill-informed, or perhaps unwilling to talk. So Dr. Armstrong chatted instead of the weather and of fishing. He was tired after his long motor drive. His eyeballs ached. Driving west, you were driving against the sun. Yes. He was very tired. The sea and perfect peace, that was what he needed. He would like, really, to take a long holiday, but he couldn't afford to do that. He could afford it financially, of course, but he couldn't afford to drop out. He was soon forgotten nowadays. No, now that he had arrived, he must keep his nose to the grindstone. He thought, all the same, this evening, I'll imagine to myself that I'm not going back, that I've done with London and Harley Street and all the rest of it. There was something magical about an island. The mere words suggested fantasy. You lost touch with the world. An island was a world of its own, a world, perhaps, from which you might never return. He thought, I'm leaving my ordinary life behind me. And smiling to himself, he began to make plans, fantastic plans for the future. He was still smiling when he walked up the rock-cut steps. In a chair on the terrace, an old gentleman was sitting, and the sight of him was vaguely familiar to Dr. Armstrong. Where had he seen that frog-like face, that tortoise-like neck, that hunched-up attitude? Yes, and those pale, shrewd little eyes. Of course, old Wargrave. He'd given evidence once before him. Always looked half asleep, but was shrewd as could be when it came to a point of law. Had great power with the jury. It was said he could make their minds up for them any day of the week. He'd got one or two unlikely convictions out of them. A hanging judge, some people said. Funny place to meet him. Here. Out of the world. Mr. Justice Wargrave thought to himself, Armstrong? Remember him in the witness box, very correct and cautious. All doctors are damn fools. Harley Street ones are the worst of the lot. And his mind dwelt malevolently on a recent interview he had had with a suave personage in that very street. Aloud, he grunted, Drinks are in the hall. Dr. Armstrong said, I must go and pay my respects to my host and hostess. Mr. Justice Wargrave closed his eyes again, looking decidedly reptilian, and said, oh, You can't do that. Dr. Armstrong was startled. And why not? The judge said, No host and hostess. Very curious state of affairs. Don't understand this place. Dr. Armstrong stared at him for a minute. When he thought the old gentleman had actually gone to sleep, Wargrave said suddenly, 
Do you know Constance Calmington? Uh, no, I am afraid I don't. It's of no consequence, said the judge. Very vague woman, and practically unreadable handwriting. I was just wondering if I'd come to the wrong house. Dr. Armstrong shook his head and went on up to the house. Mr. Justice Wargrave reflected on the subject of Constance Calmington. Undependable, like all women. His mind went on to the two women in the house, the tight-lipped old maid and the girl. He didn't care for the girl. Cold-blooded young hussy. No, three women if you counted the Rogers woman. Odd creature. She looked scared to death. A respectable pair and knew their job. Rogers, coming out on the terrace that minute, the judge asked him, Is Lady Constance Calmington expected, do you know? Rogers stared at him. Uh, no, sir. Not to my knowledge. The judge's eyebrows rose, but he only grunted. He thought, Indian Island, eh? There's a cuckoo in the nest. Anthony Marston was in his bath. He luxuriated in the steaming water. His limbs had felt cramped after his long drive. Very few thoughts passed through his head. Anthony was a creature of sensation and of action. He thought to himself, Must go through with it, I suppose, and thereafter dismissed everything from his mind. Warm, steaming water, tired limbs, presently a shave, a cocktail, dinner. And after? Mr. Bloor was tying his tie. He wasn't very good at this sort of thing. Did he look all right? He supposed so. Nobody had been exactly cordial to him. Funny the way they all eyed each other, as though they knew. Well, it was up to him. He didn't mean to bungle his job. He glanced up at the framed nursery rhyme over the mantelpiece. Neat touch, having that there. He thought, Remember this island when I was a kid. Never thought I'd be doing this sort of job in a house here. Good thing, perhaps, that one can't foresee the future. General MacArthur was frowning to himself. Damn it all! The whole thing was deuced odd. Not at all what he'd been led to expect. For two pins he'd make an excuse and get away. Throw up the whole business. But the motorboat had gone back to the mainland. He'd have to stay. That fellow Lombard now. He was a queer chap. Not straight. He'd swear the man wasn't straight. As the gong sounded, Philip Lombard came out of his room and walked to the head of the stairs. He moved like a panther, smoothly and noiselessly. There was something of the panther about him altogether. A beast of prey. Pleasant to the eye. He was smiling to himself. A week, eh? He was going to enjoy that week. In her bedroom, Emily Brent, dressed in black silk, ready for dinner, was reading her Bible. Her lips moved as she followed the words, The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. The wicked shall be turned into hell. Her tight lips closed. She shut the Bible. Rising, she pinned a cairngorm brooch at her neck and went down to dinner. Chapter 3 Dinner was drawing to a close. The food had been good, the wine perfect. Rogers waited well. Everyone was in better spirits. They had begun to talk to each other with more freedom and intimacy. Mr. Justice Wargrave, mellowed by the excellent port, was being amusing in a caustic fashion. Dr. Armstrong and Tony Marston were listening to him. Miss Brent chatted to General MacArthur. They had discovered some mutual friends. Vera Claythorne was asking Mr. Davis intelligent questions about South Africa. Mr. Davis was quite fluent on the subject. Lombard listened to the conversation. Once or twice he looked up quickly, and his eyes narrowed. Now and then his eyes played round the table, studying the others. Anthony Marston said suddenly, 
Quaint, these things, aren't they? In the centre of the round table, on a circular glass stand, were some little china figures. Indians, said Tony. Indian Island. I suppose that's the idea. Vera leaned forward. I wonder, how many are there? Ten? Yes, ten there are. Vera cried, What fun! They're the ten little Indian boys of the nursery rhyme, I suppose. In my bedroom the rhyme is framed and hung over the mantelpiece. Lombard said, In my room too. And mine. And mine. Everybody joined the chorus. Vera said, It's an amusing idea, isn't it? Mr. Justice Wargrave grunted, Remarkably childish, and helped himself to port. Emily Brent looked at Vera Claythorne. Vera Claythorne looked at Miss Brent. The two women rose. In the drawing-room, the French windows were open onto the terrace, and the sound of the sea murmuring against the rocks came up to them. Emily Brent said, A Pleasant sound. Vera said sharply, I hate it. Miss Brent's eyes looked at her in surprise. Vera flushed. She said more composedly, I don't think this place would be very agreeable in a storm. Emily Brent agreed. I've no doubt the house is shut up in winter, she said. You'd never get servants to stay here, for one thing. Vera murmured, It must be difficult to get servants anyway. Emily Brent said, Mrs. Oliver has been lucky to get these two. The woman's a good cook. Vera thought, Funny how elderly people always get names wrong. She said, Yes, I think Mrs. Owen has been very lucky indeed. Emily Brent had brought a small piece of embroidery out of her bag. Now, as she was about to thread her needle, she paused. She said sharply, Owen? Did you say Owen? Yes. Emily Brent said sharply, I've never met anyone called Owen in my life. Vera stared. Oh, but surely... She did not finish her sentence. The door opened, and the men joined them. Rogers followed them into the room with the coffee tray. The judge came and sat down by Emily Brent. Armstrong came up to Vera. Tony Marston strolled to the open window. Bloor studied with naive surprise a statuette in brass, wondering perhaps if its bizarre angularities were really supposed to be the female figure. General MacArthur stood with his back to the mantelpiece. He pulled at his little white moustache. That had been a damn good dinner. His spirits were rising. Lombard turned over the pages of punch that lay with the other papers on a table by the wall. Rogers went round with the coffee tray. The coffee was good, really black and very hot. The whole party had dined well. They were satisfied with themselves and with life. The hands of the clock pointed to twenty minutes past nine. There was a silence. A comfortable, replete silence. Into that silence came the voice. Without warning, inhuman, penetrating. Ladies and gentlemen, silence, please. Everyone was startled. They looked round, at each other, at the walls, who was speaking. The voice went on, a high, clear voice. You are charged with the following indictments. Edward George Armstrong, that you did upon the 14th day of March, 1925, cause the death of Louisa Mary Cleese, Emily Caroline Brent, that upon the 5th of November, 1931, you were responsible for the death of Beatrice Taylor, William Henry Bloor, that you brought about the death of James Stephen Landor on October the 10th, 1928. Vera Elizabeth Claythorne, that on the 11th day of August, 1935, you killed Cyril Ogilvy Hamilton. Philip Lombard, that upon a date in February, 1932, you were guilty of the death of 21 men, members of an East African tribe. John Gordon MacArthur, that on the 4th of January, 1917, you deliberately sent your wife's lover, Arthur Richmond, to his death. Anthony James Marston, that upon the 14th day of November last you were guilty of the murder of John and Lucy Coombs. Thomas Rogers and Ethel Rogers, that on the 6th of May, 1929, you brought about the death of Jennifer Brady. Lawrence John Wargrave, that upon the 10th day of June, 1930, you were guilty of the murder of Edward Seaton. Prisoners at the bar, have you anything to say in your defence? 
The voice had stopped. There was a moment's petrified silence, and then a resounding crash. Rogers had dropped the coffee tray. At the same moment, from somewhere outside the room, there came a scream and the sound of a thud. Lombard was the first to move. He leapt to the door and flung it open. Outside, lying in a huddled mass, was Mrs. Rogers. Lombard called, Marston! Antony sprang to help him. Between them, they lifted up the woman and carried her into the drawing room. Dr. Armstrong came across quickly. He helped them to lift her onto the sofa and bent over her. He said quickly, It's nothing. She's fainted, that's all. She'll be round in a minute. Lombard said to Rogers, Get some brandy. Rogers, his face white, his hands shaking, murmured, Yes, sir, and slipped quickly out of the room. Vera cried out, Who was that speaking? Where was he? It sounded... It sounded... General MacArthur spluttered out, What's going on here? What kind of a practical joke was that? His hand was shaking. His shoulders sagged. He looked suddenly ten years older. Blore was mopping his face with a handkerchief. Only Mr. Justice Wargrave and Miss Brent seemed comparatively unmoved. Emily Brent sat upright, her head held high. In both cheeks was a spot of hard colour. The judge sat in his habitual pose, his head sunk down into his neck. With one hand, he gently scratched his ear. Only his eyes were active, darting round and round the room, puzzled, alert with intelligence. Again, it was Lombard who acted. Armstrong being busy with the collapsed woman, Lombard was free once more to take the initiative. He said, That voice. It sounded as though it were in the room. Vera cried, Who was it? Who was it? It wasn't one of us. Like the judge, Lombard's eyes wandered slowly round the room. They rested a minute on the open window. Then he shook his head decisively. Suddenly, his eyes lighted up. He moved forward swiftly to where a door near the fireplace led to an adjoining room. With a swift gesture, he caught the handle and flung the door open. He passed through and immediately uttered an exclamation of satisfaction. He said, Ah, here we are. The others crowded after him. Only Miss Brent remained alone, sitting erect in her chair. Inside the second room, a table had been brought up close to the wall, which adjoined the drawing room. On the table was a gramophone, an old-fashioned type with a large trumpet attached. The mouth of the trumpet was against the wall, and Lombard, pushing it aside, indicated where two or three small holes had been unobtrusively bored through the wall. Adjusting the gramophone, he replaced the needle on the record, and immediately they heard again, You are charged with the following indictments. Vera cried, Turn it off! Turn it off! It's horrible! Lombard obeyed. Dr. Armstrong said, with a sigh of relief, A disgraceful and heartless practical joke, I suppose. The small, clear voice of Mr. Justice Wargrave murmured, So you think it's a joke, do you? The doctor stared at him. What else could it be? The hand of the judge gently stroked his upper lip. He said, At the moment, I'm not prepared to give an opinion. Antony Marston broke in. He said, Look here, there's one thing you've forgotten. Who the devil turned the thing on and set it going? Wargrave murmured, Yes, I think we must inquire into that. He led the way back into the drawing room. The others followed. Rogers had just come in with a glass of brandy. Miss Brent was bending over the moaning form of Mrs. Rogers. Adroitly, Rogers slipped between the two women. Allow me, madam. I'll speak to her. Ethel. Ethel, it's all right. All right, you hear? Pull yourself together. Mrs. Rogers' breath came in quick gasps. Her eyes, staring, frightened eyes, went round and round the ring of faces. There was urgency in Rogers' tone. Pull yourself together, Ethel. Dr. Armstrong spoke to her soothingly. You'll be all right now, Mrs. Rogers. Just a nasty turn. She said, Did, did I faint, sir? Yes. It was the voice, that awful voice, like a judgment. Her face turned green again, her eyelids fluttered. Dr. Armstrong said sharply, Where's that brandy? Rogers put it down on a little table. Someone handed it to the doctor, and he bent over the gasping woman with it. Drink this, Mrs. Rogers. 
She drank, choking a little and gasping. The spirit did her good. The color returned to her face. She said, I'm all right now. It just gave me a turn. Rogers said quickly, Well, of course it did. Gave me a turn, too. Fair made me drop that tray. Wicked lies it was. I'd like to know— He was interrupted. It was only a cough. A dry little cough, but it had the effect of stopping him in full cry. He stared at Mr. Justice Wargrave, and the latter coughed again. Then he said, Who put that record on the gramophone? Was it you, Rogers? Rogers cried, I didn't know what it was. Before God, I didn't know what it was, sir. If I had, I'd never have done it. The judge said dryly, That is probably true. But I think you'd better explain, Rogers. The butler wiped his face with a handkerchief. He said earnestly, I, I was just obeying orders, sir, that's all. Whose orders? Mr. Owen's. Mr. Justice Wargrave said, Let me get this quite clear. Mr. Owen's orders were what, exactly? Roger said, I was to put a record on the gramophone. I'd find the record in the drawer, and my wife was to start the gramophone when I'd gone into the drawing room with a coffee tray. The judge murmured, A very remarkable story. Rogers cried, It's the truth, sir. I swear to God it's the truth. I didn't know what it was. Not for a moment. It had a name on it. I thought it was just a piece of music. Wargrave looked at Lombard. Was there a title on it? Lombard nodded. He grinned suddenly, showing his white, pointed teeth. He said, Quite right, sir. It was entitled Swan Song. General MacArthur broke out suddenly. He exclaimed, The whole thing is preposterous, preposterous, slinging accusations about like this. Something must be done about it. This fellow Owen, whoever he is— Emily Brent interrupted. She said sharply, Well, that's just it. Who is he? The judge interposed. He spoke with the authority that a lifetime in the courts had given him. He said, That is exactly what we must go into very carefully. I should suggest that you get your wife to bed, first of all, Rogers, then come back here. Yes, sir. Dr. Armstrong said, I'll give you a hand, Rogers. Leaning on the two men, Mrs. Rogers tottered out of the room. When they had gone, Tony Marston said, Don't know about you, sir, but I could do with a drink. Lombard said, I agree. Tony said, I'll go and forage. He went out of the room. He returned a second or two later, found them all waiting on a tray outside, ready to be brought in. He set down his burden carefully. The next minute or two was spent in dispensing drinks. General MacArthur had a stiff whiskey, and so did the judge. Everyone felt the need of a stimulant. Only Emily Brent demanded and obtained a glass of water. Dr. Armstrong re-entered the room. She's all right, he said. I've given her a sedative to take. What's that, a drink? I could do with one. Several of the men refilled their glasses. A moment or two later, Rogers re-entered the room. Mr. Justice Wargrave took charge of the proceedings. The room became an impromptu court of law. The judge said, and Now then, Rogers, we must get to the bottom of this. Who is this Mr. Owen? Rogers stared. Well, he owns this place, sir. I am aware of that fact. What I want you to tell me is what you yourself know about the man. Rogers shook his head. I can't say, sir. You see, I've never seen him. There was a faint stir in the room. General MacArthur said, You've never seen him? What do you mean? We've only been here just under a week, sir, my wife and I. We were engaged by letter, through an agency, the Regina Agency in Plymouth. Bloor nodded. Old established firm, he volunteered. Wargrave said, Have you got that letter? Or the letter engaging us? No, sir, I didn't keep it. Go on with your story. You were engaged, as you say, by letter. Yes, sir. We were to arrive on a certain day, and we did. Everything was in order here. Plenty of food in stock and everything very nice. Just needed dusting and that. What next? Nothing, sir. We got orders. 
by letter again to prepare the rooms for a house party, and then, yesterday, by the afternoon post, I got another letter from Mr. Owen. It said he and Mrs. Owen were detained, and to do the best we could, and it gave the instructions about dinner and coffee and put in on the gramophone record. The judge said sharply, Surely you've got that letter? Yes, sir. I've got it here. He produced it from a pocket. The judge took it. Hmm, he said. Headed Ritz Hotel and typewritten. With a quick movement, Bloor was beside him. He said, If you'll just let me have a look. He twitched it out of the other's hand and ran his eye over it. He murmured, Coronation machine, quite new, no defects. Ensign paper, the most widely used make. You won't get anything out of that. Might be fingerprints, but I doubt it. Wargrave stared at him with sudden attention. Antony Marston was standing beside Bloor, looking over his shoulder. He said, Got some fancy Christian names, hasn't he? Ulick Norman Owen. Quite a mouthful. The old judge said with a slight start, I am obliged to you, Mr. Marston. You have drawn my attention to a curious and suggestive point. He looked round at the others, and thrusting his neck forward like an angry tortoise, he said, I think the time has come for us all to pool our information. It would be well, I think, for everybody to come forward with all the information they have regarding the owner of this house. He paused and then went on, We are all his guests. I think it would be profitable if each one of us were to explain exactly how that came about. There was a moment's pause. Then Emily Brent spoke with decision. There's something very peculiar about all this, she said. I received a letter with a signature that was not very easy to read. It purported to be from a woman I had met at a certain summer resort two or three years ago. I took the name to be either Ogden or Oliver. I am acquainted with the Mrs. Oliver, and also with the Miss Ogden. I am quite certain that I have never met or become friendly with anyone of the name of Owen. Mr. Justice Wargrave said, You have that letter, Miss Brent? Yes, I will fetch it for you. She went away and returned a minute later with the letter. The judge read it. He said, I begin to understand. Uh, Miss Claythorne? Vera explained the circumstances of her secretarial engagement. The judge said, Marston? Antony said, Got a wire from a pal of mine, Badger Barclay. Surprised me at the time, because I had no idea the old horse had gone to Norway. Told me to roll up here. Again, Wargrave nodded. He said, A Dr. Armstrong. I was called in professionally. I see. You had no previous acquaintanceship with the family. No. A colleague of mine was mentioned in the letter. The judge said, To give verisimilitude, yes. And that colleague, I presume, was momentarily out of touch with you. Well, uh, yes. Lombard, who had been staring at Bloor, said suddenly, Look here, I've just thought of something. The judge lifted a hand. In a minute. But I... We will take one thing at a time, Mr. Lombard. We are at present inquiring into the causes which have resulted in our being assembled here tonight. General MacArthur. Pulling at his moustache, the general muttered, "'Got a letter from this fellow Owen. Mentioned some old pals of mine who would be here. Hoped I'd excuse informal invitation. Haven't kept the letter, I'm afraid.' Wargrave said, a "'Mr. Lombard?' Lombard's brain had been active. Was he to come out in the open, or not? He made up his mind. "'Same sort of thing,' he said. "'Invitation? Mention of mutual friends? I fell for it, all right.' I've torn up the letter. Mr. Justice Wargrave turned his attention to Mr. Bloor. His forefinger stroked his upper lip, and his voice was dangerously polite. He said, Just now we had a somewhat disturbing experience. An apparently disembodied voice spoke to us all by name, uttering certain precise accusations against us. We will deal with those accusations presently. At the moment I am interested in a minor point. Amongst the names recited was that of William Henry Bloor. But as far as we know, there is no one named Bloor amongst us. The name of Davis was not mentioned. 
What have you to say about that, Mr. Davis? Bloor said sulkily. Cat's out of the bag, it seems. I suppose I'd better admit that my name isn't Davis. You are William Henry Bloor? Oh, that's right. I will add something, said Lombard. Not only are you here under a false name, Mr. Bloor, but in addition, I've noticed this evening that you're a first-class liar. You claim to have come from Natal, South Africa. I know South Africa and Natal, and I'm prepared to swear you've never set foot in South Africa in your life. All eyes were turned on Bloor, angry, suspicious eyes. Anthony Marston moved a step nearer to him. His fists clenched themselves. Now then, you swine, he said. Any explanation? Bloor flung back his head and set his square jaw. You gentlemen have got me wrong, he said. I've got my credentials and you can see them. I'm an ex-CID man. I run a detective agency in Plymouth. I was put on this job. Mr. Justice Wargrave asked, By whom? This man Owen. Enclosed a handsome money order for expenses and instructed me as to what he wanted done. I was to join the house party, posing as a guest. I was given all your names. I was to watch you all. Any reason given? Bloor said bitterly. Mrs. Owen's jewels. <laughs> Mrs. Owen, my foot. I don't believe there's any such person. Again the forefinger of the judge stroked his lip, this time appreciatively. Your conclusions are, I think, justified, he said. Ulick Norman Owen, in Miss Brent's letter, though the signature of the surname is a mere scrawl. The Christian names are reasonably clear. Una Nancy, in either case you notice the same initials, Ulick Norman Owen, Una Nancy Owen. Each time that is to say, U.N. Owen, or, by a slight stretch of fancy, unknown. Vera cried, But this is fantastic, mad. The judge nodded gently. He said, Oh, yes. I've no doubt in my own mind that we have been invited here by a madman. Probably a dangerous, homicidal lunatic. 